Well, Michael and Mary, thank you for being sent by our church and representing us well and for the reports. Encouraging to hear what the Lord is doing in Alaska. And it's also good to know that the Lord's using us all the way up to the very end of what we know as Parkside Baptist Church. By our unanimous decision just a couple weeks ago, we are numbered, our weeks are numbered as, as this church as we know it. And yet, all of us here need to recognize and, and, and need to certainly acknowledge um, that the Lord has, has brought us to this point. It would not have happened if it were not his leadership, and it certainly would not have happened unanimously in a Baptist church. I mean, what, it's our knee-jerk reaction to be a little bit contentious, and yet God gave us unity, and I've written about that on the backside of your bulletin today if you want to take a read about it. I've just been really moved by the fact that we have unity in this moment, such a momentous choice to effectively close our church and, you know, take all of our energy and our efforts and our assets and breathe life into this new church and really establish um, Overland Church with a foothold in Durango. I don't want this merger to be a matter of financial or even missional stewardship alone. This merger, I want us to understand it to represent God's calling and provision in each of our lives here today. Anyone who makes up Parkside Baptist Church and has, has chosen to see this new church come into being, um, not necessarily by, by the fact that we sent it, by, but by the fact that we're really endowing this church with such an opportunity. This isn't just God, you know, breaking continuity. There's a temptation that each of us perhaps face that this transition might seem like that, might seem like discontinuity in our spiritual landscape. Um, really, what God has done to bring about this merger is not just what he's done in spite of you or even against you. We might think that in our sinfulness and our flesh, but rather it was really done for you and for me. It's been done for us, for our good. It's not the case that God has done this as some kind of a consequence. Really, this is a new stage, a new opportunity, not just for us, but for the kingdom of God in Durango. Maybe the Lord will use this transition to orchestrate some kind of other change in your life, but so long as you're in this community, I hope that you know that God has not simply called you to this church, but through your investment in First Southern Baptist Church, then Parkside, all of what God's been doing the last 70 years has been leading up to this moment, and there will be a, 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 a continuity, a gospel continuity between who we are today and who we're going to be the first Sunday of January. There is there's no break in the gospel lineage in the message that we're sharing, and in what that church will represent compared to what we've hoped to represent for these last 70 years. And it's not just being done for the good of the kingdom, it's being done for the good of the people in this room. God has accomplished this for your benefit and for mine. And sometimes you preach the sermon you need to hear, and this is definitely the one that I need to hear, and I'm bringing myself around to believing some of the things I'm going to teach you today. So I don't want to come off like, you know, this is all super easy, but I do want you to know that as I'm struggling with this, I guess I'm being put in a position where, you know, I, I'm, I'm, up, I'm, I'm shepherding from a, a place of knowledge, from experience. God is going to show us what he's done in the church. In, in, in this moment for us is what he's always done. He's always guided and directed the church across history to his ultimate victory and the ultimate good of his people. Your work here has not been for nothing. It's been for this. It's been for what we're going to see here in just a couple of weeks. The name and the style and the leadership may be different, but the Lord has used us to help establish this new church with a foothold in this community. And he will use your presence, your personal presence in the church to establish Overland Church in a robust faith, in the sincere congeniality that you'll bring, and a lifestyle of service that is steeped in a love for God's word. That is what all of you bring to the table here. Our passage is going to be Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 16. And it's really a passage um, that's somewhat related to what we just finished up in Luke with the ascension. And, and Paul is going to talk about the ascension and how God is, uh, you know, of course, in, in the person of Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning in your personal life for the benefit of the local church. And I want to use this passage as a reminder of what it's going to take for us to be helpful in this new congregation and, and not so much um, saying, hey, behave, but also saying, 
look, this is not just a transaction of assets. It's actually a benefit that the people I know and love here in this room are being put into this merger to bless this new church. There is something that they need that you have that the Lord has planned for you to supply in this new congregation. And you are not some second-class citizen in this because we're coming from the smaller congregation or because of your age or because of your background or experience. It's because of all those things you bring to the table that the Lord has given us as a gift to this new church and we get to be a part of what the Lord's going to do over there. So I'm looking forward to this message and I hope it's deeply practical um, even as we're going to be talking some theology about the ascension. I hope you understand that what the Lord has for us and what's in store for us is work and service and a calling that you have been called to because you've been part of this moment. Let's go ahead and look at Ephesians 4 verse 1. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve unity in the spirit of the body, sorry, unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression he ascended. What does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also the one who ascended far above all heavens so that he might fill all things. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until all attains the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature man to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and de deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are growing up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, whom, for, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together, by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this word. God, as we apply this to our moment, uh, collectively we are all experiencing this moment of transition, of looking forward to this merger, of wondering what our place will be in there. God, you have established your church. The church has always belonged to you and will always belong to you, God. And we know that the gates of hell will not prevent, pre prevail against it, Lord. So as we're all going into this nervous and hopeful, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would give us comfort in knowing that, yes, things will be different, and yes, absolutely, we belong to this new ministry, and that you have plans for us and hopes for us, and God, even requirements for us in this new ministry. God, equip us with eagerness um, to be humble people that would seek the unity of the body and that we would preserve the faith in that we would grow this new congregation with the talents and gifts that you have given us. Amen. At the very outset, this passage starts with the message of the call. Oz Guinness, he's an author. Uh, he wrote a book called The Call, and he, he, he said it this way. The first call of every disciple is, first of all, a call to Christ himself. Come, follow me. The first call of every person in this room if you've believed in Jesus, is come, follow me. It's the call of a disciple. It's a call to walk alongside Jesus. It's a call to live an intimate life patterned after obedience of the Savior who's called you to himself, who's adopted you to sonship, who's forgiven you for your sins. And Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It's a powerful verse. And what you see in verse one here of, of chapter four is that Paul is imploring us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Walk. The calling that you have received is not a decision fixed in time. A call to repentance, a call to confess your sins, is the first in a continuum of, uh, of following Christ. 
we are called to walk in that calling. It's not a decision fixed in time. It's a pattern of life, ever moving, ever pursuing Jesus. And we're called to, to walk in a manner worthy of this calling. Well, worthy is a tricky word, and we need to say it, that there was nothing worthy about you that got you saved. I think it was Jonathan Edwards that has this quote. It says, the only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. I saw that quote like four or five different times this week, not seeking it out. It was just everywhere. (laughs) So apparently you need to hear it. The only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. So we, when we have been called out of damnation by the gift of God's grace, if we've received that salvation by grace, by the worthiness of Christ, then our walk responds really with, with just awe and eagerness. So a worthy walk on our end is just one of extreme gratefulness. A worthy walk is one that acts like it's been saved from something. You've been saved out of sin. So turn away, go, go chase Jesus. But a worthy walk, as we're gonna see in this passage, is not a matter of just ceasing from sin, but a worthy walk acts like it's been saved for a divine purpose. You have been saved for a purpose, not because of good works you've done, but because God's used your salvations as an end to a mean because he's predestined good works in advance for you to do. There's a purpose with why you were saved. There's a reason why you've been called to be a Christian. Paul puts it in Philippians 3.12, I want to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. If you need a motto, that's it. I want to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. When you were saved, God had good works in mind for you to do that he saved you to accomplish so that you could do those things in his power. I want to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. There's a purpose. There's a divine purpose in your being saved. So walk in the matter worthy of your calling. The characteristics of a worthy walk here are not many, but it's really just sort of One idea compounded many times. Read it in verse uh, two with me. This is a worthy walk described. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So a worthy walk, it's really, you could try to Break it down and say, well, it's, oh, it's humility and gentleness and patience. No, it's all these things combined together. It's humility and gentleness with peace, sorry, with patience, showing tolerance for one another. To what end? So that you can preserve, so that you can be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Of course, of course, this is among Christians. It's going to spell it out in the very next verse. But the unity that we have, of course, comes from our common salvation. So a worthy walk here is being spelled out, not so much as go be a better person. Of course, that's the consequence. It's going to happen by the power of God sanctifying your life. But he's telling them from chains, look, I want you to walk worthy of the calling of Christ to himself that you would live a corresponding life that builds unity among believers. Your job as a called Christian, is primarily, first of all, to Christ himself. Secondarily, to preserve the unity of Christians, to walk and live in community with Christians, to put on these characteristics, really just exemplifying who Christ was. He was patient. He was humble. He was gentle. He showed tolerance to those who would constantly fail him so that he could bring a bond of peace between those he loves. That is the moral virtue of Christians. This, this, it's really a relational virtue ethic that we have to impl- uh, uh, just, uh, you know, I am trying to find a word and I can't find it. We should, we should look like Christ. Let's just put it that way. In our relationship with one another. Exemplify Christ and his kingdom ethic with how we treat other Christians. We get so caught up in reaching out in evangelism because these are such important things. But the first call to Christ himself, the second call given immediately here, take care of your Christians, take care of your family, take care of your spiritual household that God has put you into. We are are saved for the purpose 
of pursuing unity and peace with fellow Christians. These are not traits of passivity. A lot of times men hear this list and we're like, great, so be a little bit more effeminate. Uh, no thanks. Um, it's not true. These are traits not of passivity. This is the skilled touch of a craftsman building and maintaining something beautiful. You know, there was nothing effeminate about our Lord, but he was certainly humble. He was certainly gentle. He used his strength and, and regulated it for the purpose of serving others, not for demeaning, not for being a tyrant, and he certainly was no slave. He negotiated with his followers. Here's how we're going to live. We're going to live in unity. Now we're told explicitly this, this is about Christians. This is the secondary call. The call of Christ is first to himself, second to Christ's body, as we're seeing in this passage here. Verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope in your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We are called into the church. We are called for the purpose of preserving unity and the bond of peace, not generally, but specifically for the one body of Christ. We are sharing a common calling, a calling hope, a, a, a common a grace that we have all received from the one Lord. And we've all been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the same faith. We've all been regenerated by the one Father who has sent his Son to die for us. And so when we're looking at this merger, we need to remember something theologically first. We are saved into the church. We are not saved by it. Other, faith, uh, other Christian traditions um, would say that you're, you're saved into the ark of salvation. That is the church. The church is actually the one that accomplishes your salvation. I would disagree with this completely. You are not saved by the church. You are saved by, what is it? Oh, the one Lord, the one faith, the one uh, God and Father. That's who you're saved by. But what does he save you into? The one body. He saves you into the one body. Your personal salvation, as wonderful it as, as it is that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, it's not unique to you in that you have something that other Christians don't. You have what every Christian has, the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of your sins. And so you've been called into a common experience with other believers. So you've been saved, yes, a personal relationship with Jesus, but you've been saved into the church, a community that God has granted you the moment he called you by name. We are saved not into a rugged individualism. A lot of times we make this mistake as Christians. We, are, we think, well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna go experience him on my hike or in my recliner and I don't need those other believers. It's not supported by this verse and I'm promising you, you're not gonna support it with any other verse. There's also no redefining Christianity by your own terms. People say, well, it's a personal relationship with Jesus and in my, in my devotional time, which is good, you should have that. It's not allowing you to say some kind of post-millennial thing of like, well, this is my truth, my Christianity. No, you are saved into a faith, one faith that was imparted to you, once for all given to the saints. It was given to a group, to a body and to a bride, and you get to be a part of that. You've been one to that collective, personally invited by the Savior to join his communal body of faith. So you don't get to redefine Christianity as something unique unto you. You don't get to dictate the terms. And I've, I've actually received some criticism for using the word religion when I talk about Christianity. And I grew up in a time where it was cool to say, well, Christianity is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's like, you know what? I don't like that language anymore because it teaches people that they get to sort of dictate the terms and redefine Christianity as what is convenient to them. And that's just not the case. We are called into a saving faith that is characterized by a body of people who worship the Savior together. So we don't get to forsake the gathering. We don't get to go be rugged individualist Christians just live streaming our celebrity pastors on the internet or on cable or wherever you watch it. We need to be people that are committed to living life together, worshiping the Lord. Because why? There is one body, one spirit. Nothing unique has happened to you except for the fact that you are uniquely called into this common experience of a saving faith characterized by the church. So the body works 
because it's imbued and identified with the presence of God. You have, it's the Father, right? Who is, over, who is uh, in all and over all. And th- uh, sorry, let me just read it. Verse six. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This collective, wonderful, all-encompassing salvation that we've all been called to. We walk in a worthy manner when we preserve this body and our shared gospel, our singular message that saves any man who would receive it. So this passage is just so steeped in the necessity of the local church. It strongly emphasizes that our secondary calling for all Christians is to be a part of the community that God has established. So even though we have more passage to go through, just immediate applications for us going through this merger is that this merger does not excuse you or me to disengage from the body of Christ. This isn't your convenient way out. This isn't the time where you say, oh, you look, terms have changed, so I'm out of here. Uh, you know, it's hard to get to church, and we might have to meet at another location for a couple of weeks, so it's just, if they cared about, I mean, if they cared about reaching me, they'd do things on my terms. That is not the language of Christians. You must seek the unity of the peace of the body. It is your duty to invest in keeping this new congregation holy and healthy. The second thing I want us to know is that this merger may represent some kind of a relief, you know, from from the amount that it's being asked of you, or, or maybe your roles might change, but your primary and secondary callings remain. You're first a disciple to Christ. You're secondarily a disciple with a bunch of other disciples around you. You are called to serve the body. Service and sacrifice are expected of you. Not from me, because I'm going to be next to nobody in this new congregation, but by the Spirit who called you and the Father who is over all. All of us have a, a role to play. Whether we like the new terms is not really a question. It's the fact that, are these the terms that the Lord has given you? And if yes, then absolutely you have a place to serve. And God will make a point of making sure that you have a way to contribute. God who used you to establish this church will use you to preserve and strengthen this church. It's not all obligation and duty. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to a new calling, to a new congregation that needs to be blessed by the likes of you. There is absolute gospel continuity between who we are today and who we're going to be on the first Sunday in January when we're under a whole new banner, meeting in a whole new building, under a whole new pastor. This is the same church because it's, it's the church that God has established and called to himself. It's a different name, but all our earthly terms have changed, but nothing essential about it has changed. It's a community of believers like you who need the word of God like you who have been given gifts to serve you just like you've been called to serve them. There is one body. There is one faith. There's nothing new here even though it feels pretty new. On one sense, it feels like a new church, a new calling. But you've been selected to serve a distinct role in this new church. You have a part to play that's vital to the health of this new body. The spiritual maturity that's in this room is, is immense. And like I've told you guys before, oftentimes our community has never given us a chance simply because of optics. But I know what these people are getting, and they're getting the, just the most heartwarming and encouraging and dedicated group of believers I've ever been a part of. There is spiritual development that these people need because of their stage of life, because they haven't experienced what you've experienced. There's people in this room that have been through things that I could never imagine, and yet you follow the Lord, and yet you praise him. You've buried children. You've buried spouses. You've, you've lost, you know, all sorts of points of familiarity and points of pride, and yet you are here praising the Lord through it all. And so there is such perseverance and, 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 and purity of faith in this room and this new congregation will be so blessed by having you a part of it. And so the Lord is going to use you in great ways, and I promise he's going to do it in a really intentional way, and that's what our next passages go through. Seven through ten are, are pretty much the most confusing passages in this or part of this whole passage. It's talking about the ascension of Jesus and how this ascension 
that we talked about last week really shows that Jesus is in a place of authority over the church and over believers in their participation in church. The ascension of Christ actually is, a, is the way he equips the church. So let's go ahead and read it again. And Verse seven, to each one of us, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, I would encourage you to look up 1 Peter 4.10 and Romans 12, 3 and 6. These are all passages that talk about the grace of God being tied to our various giftings and how our giftings are given in proportion to our faith and they also express various facets of God's grace to people, to his church. And so each of us are given a gift according to God's grace Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. This is the Apostle Paul doing something he can do with the Bible that none of us else can do. He's quoting Psalm 68 and adapting it a little bit, basically showing that the believers, this is Psalm 68, verse 18, that the believers have experienced some kind of an exodus, that you were captive, and that the Lord has brought you out of some form of captivity, captivity to sin. And when he ascends, he's giving gifts to men, giving gifts to the men. Well, he's going to explain it in verse nine here. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? I think this passage is, is just saying that the ascension shows us he descended in the first place. And then getting on to verse 10, he who descended is himself also the one who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. So the word so sort of gives you the point of what he's saying, right? Jesus has all authority. The man who came down on earth, he ascended and he gave gifts to men. And it was the same man, Jesus, that walked among the disciples and he did it. He ascended so that he could fill all the heavens. He's glorious. And guess what? So that he might fill all things. He has authority. And so we started with verse seven, talking about gifts, the ascension, gives us the gifts where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's descended and he's ascended. He's, he's back in his place of authority. It's a little confusing and gosh, you know, at least he gave us some periods in this passage. I always think Paul just really could buy a period. <laughs> but, you know, the authority of Jesus is expressed in those aforementioned gifts. The gifts lived out in the church are now explained to us in verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for works of service to the building up of the body of Christ. These gifts are gifts to the church. The hierarchy of Christ being ascended at the right hand of the Father. Then what does he do? He gives teachers. He gives apostles and prophets and underneath it, pastors and teachers and evangelists. Okay, so he's giving us some sort of a form of a hierarchy, but it's not for the sake of glorifying these men. It's for the sake of advancing his gospel and, and of advancing his body. In verse 11, you have the apostles and the prophets. And personally, I would take a, an approach to this that we would say these are historic gifts of the church because I believe that the apostles were numbered in the, in the dozen or so, pretty much a dozen plus or minus one, depending on you know, when you're counting. Um, you know, these were men that were given the apostolic gospel. They were told that they were in a different role and a different place in the mission of God than any other disciple would ever be. They had, in many cases, miracles on demand. They had a unique gifting of the Holy Spirit to explain and expound the gospel found in the Old Testament scriptures, and we have inherited that apostolic gospel. The prophets, they all look forward to Christ. And post-Christ, you have a bit of prophecy in, in the book of Revelation, and I really do believe that prophecy um, effectively has ceased because all of Scripture is a revelation to Christ. And we just have very few things in the way of open uh, prophecy where we're expecting Christ to come again. And I think we've all heard all we need to hear along those lines. So those are historic gifts in my mind. But I would say that evangelists, preachers, and teachers, these are contemporary and enduring gifts of the church. But verse 12 shows us why they're a gift to the church. For the equipping of the saints for works of service and to the building up of the body of Christ. The present and enduring gift that God has given to the church is believers like you. This hierarchy of men, forget them, their point is to equip you for works of service, 
for the building up of the body. You and your spiritual gifting and your salvation is God's gift to the church. You are God's gift to the church because God has called you a saint. You're a holy one. You've been given a special purpose. You've been called out to do something that God has in mind only for you to do. There's no plan B. So you are God's present gift to the church and what he plans to do through you is his plan to bless Overland Church, this new body. Or if you're from out of town, you know, wherever you end up being, your gift is for the purpose of building up the body. You are, you are called to be equipped for works of service and the building up of the body of Christ. So your calling is never going to be outside of the local church. It's never going to be abandon them, give up on them. It's never going to be, uh, you know, be unhappy with them to the point that you divorce yourself from them. We are called to be spurred on by the teaching ministry of the apostolic and prophetic messages to be a witness to our ascended Savior. Your gifts are given for the building up of other believers. You are given responsibility to the body as a result of Christ's authority over the church. He didn't ascend for nothing. It's not just up there to show off. He's up there to rule and to, uh, to call you to do good in his name. You are the means that he practices his authority on earth to bless his church and to bring about his desired end. He did not save you. He did not ascend. He did not give gifts. He did not establish teachers to encourage your church for your leisure. It's not all just strictly for you. Your salvation serves God's greater purpose for the health and advancement of his covenant people. So I want you to see this, that Christ's ascension has something to do with you. Christ's ascension has something to do with you because it means he is your king, he has given you gifts, and he has led you, cap you, led you out of captivity to do something great, to be part of a new people. In verse 13, his gifts are given in service to our primary and secondary callings. It says, let's, I guess, start in verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for works of ministry, for, sorry, for works of service and the building up of the, the body of Christ until we are all to attain the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to the measure of a mature man, to the measure and stature of Christ. So he's given us gifts for the unity of the body, where he brings it up again, and for your personal advancement in him for your own maturity, the unity of the faith with believers and the maturing of disciples who have been called to him. So you've been called by the ascended Christ who rules over all things and directs human history to his redemptive ends. He has called you to serve the local church. He gives you gifts to serve the church, resulting in your corresponding growth and intimacy with him and calling you. He's not called you outside of the local church. He's called you into it to serve it. You cannot faithfully follow Christ if your discipleship misses this mark. You cannot walk a worthy walk with Christ if you are not blessing your fellow believers. You will not be developed into the stature of Christ if your faith is not worthy in the regard of serving your fellow believers. Some of us may be looking at this merger and asking why, as if this was a consequence or some kind of punitive measure against us. Look at it differently. Why? You've called this merger, uh, and, and I guess I, we've called this merger forward, the Lord has brought it forward, because he, you have work to do, because you're needed to build up that body. It's no accident this happened now, because the Lord needs the likes of you for this community. This happened so the Lord could use it to mature us and drive us more into his likeness. There's growing yet to do. There's service yet to accomplish. There's a calling still at hand, for every single person in this room. We get to embody that humble, gentle, patient, loving, and unifying character of Christ as we get to be new members of this new congregation. The result comes so beautifully. We are no longer children. In verse 14, it says, as a result, there are no longer, we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, 
from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The result is the maturity of the members in this room. Our further maturity, we're not done. We haven't been fully developed. We've done a lot and, and perhaps we've got a resume that we can be proud of and we're worried that the people in this new church might not know it, might not value it. The Lord knows and he won't forget. But he has still got work for you to do in the development of your character, in the development of mine when it comes to looking more like Jesus. And he's bringing this about to love you more, to make you more like him so that you can enjoy him more, so that you can look more like him. The ascended Christ has given us this hierarchy and this, these gifts. And he says that as each of us as each of us as individual parts of this greater body grow together and build up this church in love that we are growing in to Christ, growing into him, the head of the church. So this beautiful message, as few periods as there are and as hard as sometimes it can be to try to track what he's saying, he's really giving us this, this sort of kaleidoscope of personal calling to himself, of communal calling to his church, an individual equipping of you with, his, with, with giftings and sending you to bless that body so that when all of those things come together, when all of those truths are experienced and lived in and amongst us as individuals, this new church will be the healthiest church in town and it will be a springboard for many, many good things. Overland Church and the good things it's doing 10 years down the road will be indebted to your participation in this church right now as we know it and in this new church, as we get to experience it here in a couple of weeks, there is an absolute continuity in gospel ministry because there is one faith, one resurrection, one baptism, all these amazing one images, absolute continuity in message and leadership of Christ, an absolute authority of Christ to bring about this church and to gift you to this new congregation so that you can bless it, so that you can be a part of it, and so that it can bless you because you certainly will be blessed by this new congregation. There will be giftings in that room that we haven't had maybe in a long time here because, you know, a church like our size, we've got a lot of good things going, but there's some holes in our ministry. In this new congregation, you get to see where the holes are and instead of complaining about it, instead of being contentious or saying, I'm done with this place, you go be the solution to that problem. And perhaps you aren't given a role and perhaps there's no title. Perhaps there's less recognition than you want. Go in humility and in love. Fill the gaps that you see in this new congregation because it's your calling. That burden is yours. The Lord's given it to you. Love the church because you love Christ. Go participate in the church because you've been saved into a personal relationship with the head of that church. He's established it and he's given you as a gift to this church and he plans to equip you, to encourage you, to maintain your faith in this one gospel that we all believe as a matter of your participation in this new body. My biggest hope for all of us here is that you have some sense of ownership in this new, new church. There's a lot being asked of us. We're going to bear the weight of the change. On the other end, they get a lot of excitement and, and, and the transition for them is more logistical for us. It's a lot more personal. So let's just lean in and enjoy what the Lord has to show us in the process of the growth and the maturity that this will certainly require of us as we eagerly participate in what the Lord has established. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for Parkside Baptist Church and who we've gotten to be before you. We love our little church. We love our little identity and, and the fact that we know everybody in the room and that we're known by everyone. God, we are so appreciative that we've all had a place to play, that we've all just gotten to really see how this place hurts when we're not here and how people are encouraged when we are. Lord, this is going to be true of the new church. It's just going to be so much more different, Lord. So make us sensitive to your leadership in our lives and how some of these hardships that we'll experience in this transition are a matter of your discipling of us to look more like you, to bless the body on your terms and not ours, and God, to enjoy and experience what you have for us. God, give us a spiritual home in this new organization. Thank you for Overland Church and what it's doing. God, and we thank you so much for sending uh, a ministry of, of like mind and faith and one that we can fully throw our endorsement behind, Lord. 
as we're dealing with the growing pains and the changes of some of our preference, Lord, and even some things that we might uh, bristle against, God, help us to care about the things that are absolute, the faith, the faith that we have, the one faith that we have that you've established and that you will maintain and preserve and promote through this new, this new church. God, give us the strength to participate in it. God, preserve us in our faith because of it. And God, encourage us to do good works as a result of the salvation that you've given us by grace. Amen. Stand and we'll sing our final song. We're going to be on uh, 414. Jesus
Deb, would you pray to close us? Dear Lord in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We, ha we also thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We love you, Lord, and as we leave this place, Lord, I pray you'll bring us back again safely next week. In your son Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Amen.